Okay, please take your seats. We're going to be starting the next session. Please take your seats. Our next session is Bird Use of Changing Habitats, and Jill Bluso Demers of San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory will be the moderator for this session. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm um, looking forward to the series of talks about birds and changing habitats, um, especially looking forward to seeing these data and how they'll be used towards adaptive management. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce the first speaker, uh, Ariana Brand with the U.S. Geological Survey. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging my co-authors. Um, who include John Takakawa, Isa Wu, Joel Shin, and Tanya Graham from the USGS, Jill Blusa Demers from SFBBO, um, Eric Mruz and Cheryl Strong from the Fish and Wildlife Service, and John Krauss from the California Department of Fish and Game. So uh, <coughs> the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project is proceeding toward the 50-50 vision, that is 50% conversion of salt pond to tidal marsh. And there's an inherent uh, balancing act in this in this transition in that there are animals that are uh, endangered due to the loss of tidal wetlands. The estimates range from 78 to 90 percent loss in the San Francisco Bay, as well as, as the water bird species that depend on managed pond habitat. And in particular, the San Francisco Bay is a critical region for migratory uh, water birds. It's considered a site of hemispheric importance for shorebirds. And it's estimated to maintain 20% uh, of the waterbird populations on the Pacific Flyway in, the, in this region, including the Central Valley. And one of the central challenges for the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project is how to maintain waterbird populations in a reduced area. So today I'm going to be primarily talking about um, a, a monitoring data set and we're going to be looking at monthly counts at high tide um, that have been overlaid in a 250 meter grid. And for some preliminary analyses, I'm, I'm, um, I've aggregated to the pond scale and I've accounted for temporal dependence. And I'm, um, I've used for some pre preliminary analyses um, a random effects as, as well as zero inflated Poisson regression, um, as well as some basic data summarization. Now, there are many birds that utilize the South Bay salt ponds. It's, it's a it's pretty phenomenal habitat. Um, well over 100 species have been detected, which we've uh, categorized into nine gills. If you look at the range of these gills, um, wading birds, terns, eared grebes, and fish-eating birds tend to be pretty low abundance overall. And the five uh, higher abundance gills inc gilds include gulls which Cheryl Strong will be talking about in one of the subsequent talks today. And I'll be focusing on the diving and dabbling ducks and the medium and the small shorebirds. And one of the things that's really, um, I think, important to note is that there's a strong seasonal shift in densities of birds in this system. And for the most part, ducks don't breed in the San Francisco Bay. Um, and there are relatively small numbers of the medium and small shorebirds. So we're really looking at the fall and the winter, the, the fall and the spring, which, uh, in which this system performs as um, migratory stopover habitat, as well as the, the wintering season um, habitat for birds that migrate farther north, or that, I'm sorry, breed farther north, but winter in the San Francisco Bay. And I'll, a lot of the patterns are pretty similar between these three seasons, and I'll be focusing on the winter season. So the USGS has collected data in restoration project ponds since 2002. And um, the, the, these include Eden Landing, El Viso, and Ravenswood. And then the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory has collected data in the salt production ponds, the Newark and Mallory plants, since 2005. And unfortunately, my next slide was actually, um, there was a technical difficulty between Windows XP and Windows 7, so it didn't come up. But um, in, in, um, I wanted to show that there, there, are, there have been increasing trends in this system during the ISP period from 2002 to 2010. In particular, dabbling ducks have shown a significant increase, particularly in El the Alviso system, 
And shorebirds, um, particularly small shorebirds, have shown a substantial and significant increase uh, over the ISP period in Eden Landing. So one of the challenges of a project like this with such a long time horizon is that we have a shifting or moving baseline. And the ISP period occurred basically from 2002 to 2008. These are sort of bracketed time frames. Um, phase one uh, was initially, the, the impl implementation began with the construction of SF2 in 2008. And I'll be really focusing on a, a data set spanning the time of 2007 to 2010, which I'm considering post-ISP pre-Phase uh, 1. And so I've eliminated certain um, Phase 1 data, that is the construction period in SF2, um, as well as A6, um, that, that have undergone Phase 1 restoration. So what we've done initially is we've classified the existing 73 ponds in the system according to five pond types. Obviously, the production ponds are those that are in active salt production. And Eric Moos, uh, John Krauss, and Cheryl Strong have classified the, the restoration ponds according to these other four types. These include, in blue, the circulating ponds, which are those that include distake, circulation, and discharge, that is, flow to and from bay waters. Batch ponds, which are those that, that perform as overflow for high salinity, to dilute high salinity, but they're also actively managed as high salinity ponds. Seasonal ponds, which are shallow. There's, there's certainly variation across these, these pond types, but seasonal ponds basically perform as shallow habitat that are where there is water, it is high salinity water. So they sort of play the role of salt pan habitat that once existed, existed in a larger marsh system, as well as the breach pods. Now, the breach ponds um, are low salinity post-breach and it, at a high tide bird survey range from medium to deep waters. Okay, so the diving ducks are basically utilizing primarily the open water low salinity ponds and the circulation ponds. And if you take a look down at the Elviso system at the bottom down here, these are the actual counts. So these are where these birds are primar primarily hanging out, particularly A1 and A2W. Small shorebirds, in contrast, are utilizing the seasonal habitat primarily. And if you put your eyes up to Eden Landing up here, particularly pond E8A, that is basically the highest density small shorebird pond in the system. And you know there's really high densities of shorebirds in that area. Medium shorebirds are more flexible than small shorebirds. They have longer legs, longer bills. They can handle, you know, a larger range of depth in water. And so they're also abundant in the seasonal ponds, but have higher abundances relatively uh, in the other pond types as well, including the breach ponds. And dabbling ducks uh, show what we would expect, really high densities in, in the circulation ponds, but they also show really high densities in the breached ponds. So I want to focus a little bit more on the breached ponds, that is, ponds A19, 20, and 21 that were discussed earlier in the earlier session. And I think perhaps this was what Mendel was asking for, is what the salinity change has been over time. And basically in the 2000, 2003 to 2009 period, specifically in these three ponds, these breached ponds, there has been a, tr a dramatic decline in salinity. I mean, these were the high salinity ponds initially, and they've declined substantially um, down to, to really quite low levels of 9 or to 12 parts per thousand from um, the pre-breach time. They were up in the 160 parts per thousand. So the converse of that is the dabbling ducks have increased dramatically. There's a very strong negative correlation here. So what is it that the dabbling ducks are responding to? Is it just the low salinity conditions? Well, I think we can take a look at some of the North Bay information to try to um, gain some insights. There's been a major effort that's ongoing in the North Bay as well. And I think it's important just to recognize how much land has been converted to date. It includes these three ponds, ponds three, four, and five, um, that were breached in um, 2006, basically. 
the Napa plant site in red that had been breached between 2008 to 2010, as well as Pond 2A, which was, you know, the, really the first in this whole system, at least for salt ponds, of course, that um, was breached in 1995. And so I'm going to, I've highlighted here actually just the ponds that I'm going to talk a little bit more about. So ponds 9 and 10, we have um, a really, to our knowledge, unique data set. Uh, unique to the San Francisco Bay, that looks at the invertebrate colonization um, in ponds 9 and 10 in relation to the adjacent uh, river and slough. Here I'm just showing the river. And what you see here on this axis is um, a set of invertebrate taxa over time. I know it's kind of small. Um, and the, the first time is December of 08, which was the month of the breach of these ponds. And the um, the axis here goes up to 25,000 um, invertebrate individuals per meter squared. So in relation to the, the river, um, what you can see is sort of an explosion um, of inverts that have come into Pond Sines 10 post-breach. And so that starts to explain some of what may be attracting birds to these uh, newly exposed, exposed breached ponds. Um, and there is a seasonal sort of undulation as some of the other invertebrate talks have shown. But um, I think that one thing that's really interesting about this is that if you look in red over here, these are the cremations and they're, um, they're crustacean detritivores. So it sort of gives you a clue as to what they're doing there. And so far I've talked exclusively about high tide, but we've also looked at a comparison of high tide versus low tide in um, breach ponds three, four, and five. And you can see there's a dramatic difference in foraging of birds in low tide versus high tide, where really they're, they're utilizing this, this exposed mudflat at low tide. And then if you bring in both the roosting and the foraging, you see just not only this shift in density, but really it's the shift in behavior. Um, again, some evidence that these exposed mudflats are really valuable. Now, if we, if we pull out the time scale somewhat, and now I'm not saying this is the final word on this, but it's just sort of an initial first cut sort of initial clue as to looking what may happen over a longer period. What you see is here, pond three is, you know, it, uh, overall this is sort of one of the most vegetated areas of pond three. Um, overall, you know, it, it doesn't appear to be more than about 2% vegetated. But you're seeing these, um, this is about five years post-breach, and you see diving duck numbers at, at high tide that are, you know, I haven't done the math on this, I guess like seven times higher perhaps than Pond 2A that is, you know, per, perhaps 90% vegetated. Now, again, this is one site against another site. It's, you know, it's, it's not a direct comparison, but it just sort of <coughs> gives us a clue as to where we may be going with the breaching of salt ponds to tidal marsh and what effect it could have on ducks and, and also shorebirds. Um, and by the way, this is a pretty conservative comparison. I've assu assumed a detection probability of one for pond three, that is perfect detection of all birds, and a detection probability of, of 0.25 for um, pond 2A. So it's a conservative comparison. So, um, you know, I th so, so this is a graph of, of the areas that either are in construction during phase one or are planned or proposed for phase two. So if these are the areas that would go to tidal marsh of the existing South Bay salt ponds. Um, so, you know, I, I guess for, to me the real question is what will be the benefit to tidal marsh species and this is over, over time, there's an important time component here, as well as what will be the impact for ducks and shorebirds. Um, and again, there's an important time, time component because of this dynamic change of habitat that's occurring. And so I would just um, suggest that perhaps it would be helpful, um, rather than looking at this system on a parcel by parcel basis, I think that it really is important to sort of try to look at this from a broad scale and to, um, and basically, I, I would suggest landscape scale mo uh, models that, that are abundance-based because it seems like a lot of people are interested in really the bird abundances. What's going to happen to the change in, um, in overall bird numbers over time that also incorporates um, habitat type and its context over time for different groups? Because I really think that 
you know, it's, it's important to look at the, at, you know, the different beneficiaries and, you know, so-called losers in, the, in this system of these birds. Um, and ideally, it would be very helpful, I think, if this were implemented within a decision support system, just to help uh, the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Ariana. Um, so next up will be Mark Herzog, who is a um, wildlife biologist with the U.S. Geological Survey. So I first want to uh, thank Laura and John for inviting me to, to present this uh, information on reproductive ecology of water birds. But it certainly has to be acknowledged that um, Josh and Colin um, are the, the visionaries of, of this program. I, I just started at USGS a year ago. And so a lot of the results I'll be presenting today are really um, based on their, their ideas and their leadership. And also the contributions of Garth Herring over the last two or three years have also been uh, extensive. Uh, this also provided me a great opportunity to, to see a lot of the, the beautiful photos that we've collected through uh, some uh, donations and also that Josh and Colin have taken. And so uh, enjoy the photos as we go through too. Uh, certainly, uh, you can't uh, get this done without collaborators and contributors. And so we, we thank both the, our logistic help and also our funding support. So. It's going to be a quick overview. There's a lot of uh, stuff to talk about when you talk about breeding ecology in water birds. And so I'm going to try to go through this really quickly, and hopefully we can uh, have some discussion uh, afterwards. But I'll, I'll first briefly just introduce, uh, I don't know if, if everybody knows who, who we are, so I'll introduce that. And then I'll, I'll talk about re reproductive ecology. And I'm dividing that into two components. There's, there's really the nesting season and then the post-hatch, so the chick rearing. And, so, and I think there's different metrics you can use to evaluate the success of, of water birds during the breeding season using those. So that's what we'll look at, um, a, a few of those. And then we'll finish with some research on the, some, some of the current research and future research that we'll be doing in the next uh, few years, a couple years. So first, uh, our, our water bird breeding program, it's, it's based at the Davis Field Station at the University of California. And we really are trying in a philosophy of, of, of focusing on long-term data. We really want the long-term research, pick a few sites, partner with the, the, the conservation and the managers that need it, and really develop long-term uh, research. And so this is an example that we've had uh, in the Central Valley where we're looking at nest success, tracking it along, over a long period of time, and then working with the managers to develop a solution to this declining nest success and, and trying to restore that that process. So the birds that we'll be talking about today are the um, the major major uh, water bird breeding water birds in the bay, and they include the American avocet and the black neck stilt, which uh, have their major the most major breeding area in the west is in in San Francisco Bay. The Forster's turn down here in the uh, oh the mouse oh sorry the Forster's turn where 30 percent of the Pacific population breeds. And then also the California gull, which has uh, increased rapidly. So this is our, um, just a, a best, I guess a summary of, of the effort that we've put forth in um, our studies of water bird uh, nesting ecology. And so it's, it's, it's now six years in the making. It's, it's nearly 10,000 nests strong, and it really covers a lot of the major water bird colonies uh, throughout the South Bay. And so, okay, this, this is just to remind me to define this. So we've got two different types or two different time periods within the breeding ecology, and one is the nesting period. And so one of the metrics we're using in terms of how successful is a restoration or how, how, how are these birds doing in terms of, of nesting is really, was it successful? And our definition of nest success is really that in that nest did one egg hatch. So that's, that's really our metric. And that's, it's important to define, at least in a biological term, so we know where we're, we're talking. And so here's an example of, of work that we did to try to, to evaluate this. And this, to, to, 
to, to, to develop the story, um, Aid is one of the ponds that is soon to be breached or will, you know, is, is being flooded. And knowing that ahead of time, there was some effort to say, well, how can we mitigate that? Is there another pond we can, we can, we can lower the water levels on and see if birds are going to respond? And so in this case, the refuge took a proactive approach here and really reduced the water in A12 in the last couple of years here to see how birds are going to respond. And we, we, can, we can evaluate that and how birds respond number-wise, numerically, or we can actually respond, look at their nest success. And so in this example that I'm going to show you, I'm just going to talk about nest success. And so as we see in um, 2008, so, so just to define the, the, the graph on the, on the, on the right-hand side, we have initiation date on the, on the lower axis. There's four panels, one for each site, one for each year. So on the left side is, is site A12, on the right side is site A9, and the years are 2008 on the bottom and 2009 on the top. <coughs> the blue histogram on the bottom is showing initiation dates. So that's basically the initiation pattern, just to, to give some background on how these birds are initiating through time. And then the curves are actually showing nest success throughout the season. And so what, one of the big things you see is that it's not just a standard nest, you know, a straight line. These actually, these birds, their success declines over time. And that's, that's important information to know. If you, if you want these birds to do well, if you want that available habitat, make sure it's available right away because that's, that's when success is going to really be um, the most, the, the water birds are going to benefit the most from it. The other the point to make on this, and we'll see this in other things, is it's just highly variable. You can see differences between sites and years. Um, in A8, there's a 38%, probably because the water levels were low and, and mammalian predators were able to get in there. So this was actually a, a really interesting slide. It, it, it's supposed to move, but I don't think we can get it here. Again, it's the technology. But um, Garth Herring did a really interesting study using videography, and it was just published here in uh, 2011 in the Southwest Naturalist, where he was looking at, we've got all this nest survival, we've got all this nest mortality. What, if, if it's all due to predation, which that part we know, is like we need to know who's doing that if we want to actually manage for that. And so we took some um, infrared cameras. I think Jill probably was involved in this part at that point, and Scott, and everybody, everybody in the room probably. Um, so this is a, a summary of that information. And, and what, what Garth found was that actually in, in this case, 71% of the predators were mammalian and only 29% avian. And there's a little caveat here in that this, in this, this year, this system, it's always different every year, the, the, the ponds such as A8 were low in water. And so areas where there usually are islands, there weren't. And so that allowed a lot of mammals to get in there. And so we, we saw a significant different, you know, a, a unexpected expect, uh, effect on those islands. And in general, some incidental uh, measures of predators that we have on, on um, sites with islands, we actually see more of a flip. We see more three to one avian predators that, uh, to, to mammalians on islands that really are isolated. We just, the, the, that does block the mammals from getting there. Um, another thing of, of, of interest is just the timing of when these predations happen. And that's that middle part here. You can see for mammals, it happens right at midnight. Those mammals are active then, that's, that's typical. What you see for the, for the avian predators, six o'clock. That's basically the closing time for the landfills. And so you see that as that, as that happens, the avian predators will guess who they are, um, come and, and can then play a role with, uh, or affect the, the water birds. So, yeah, there's lots of pretty pictures. <laughs> so once, once hatch is over, then, then, then there's um, a, a chick rearing period. And we've chosen a couple of metrics to measure, to measure success in that, that area. And one is chick growth. Uh, and we do that by visiting sites repeatedly once a week and measuring and uh, recapturing and measuring, remeasuring the individuals and chick survival. And we can do that through mark recapture of those banded birds and also through radio telemetry. And this is just a, a quick example for growth. Go uh, Gosling, that's my PhD, but um, a long time ago. Chicks, <laughs> chicks like goslings grow rapidly. And they, at, this, at this time of year, they are 
really dependent on high quality forage and on lots of forage. And so if you don't get that, it's very evident in, and you see a lot of variability because of that. And so to flip that on its side, uh, flip it over, you can use that variation in gauzing growth then to really indicate variation in quality of habitat. And so this is just a slide to show some of the variation that we're seeing, the different colors or different sites in four different metrics of uh, growth. Mass is in the upper left, and then there's uh, a wing, a tarsus, and a coleman, the beak, and just the growth rates of total interest uh, diversions. It's like you can see the tarsus grows really fast on all these chicks, and that's a life strategy, a life history strategy, because these birds can't fly right away. They need to move quick to get away from predators to hide. So they really invest a lot in the growth of tarsus and legs before other things. So just really quickly, legs, lots of legs. Uh, really, really quickly, just, just in terms of chick survival, we see uh, it's really low. It doesn't get easier after you hatch. And um, what the, I guess the points I'd make here really to note is that the stilts, look at the difference between the stilts and the avocets. And we think that's really a habitat type. Stilts are generally uh, rearing their chicks within um, vegetated areas. Avocets sometimes, but typically on more island areas where they don't have places to hide. Uh, last year we did uh, turns for the first time. We saw something in the middle, but I wouldn't want to make any conclusions on one year. Uh, we'll be doing it again this year and we'll see how things play out. Looking at that again, most of that mortality is due to predation. What are the major predators? It isn't the same chick, by the way. That other one, that other one made it. Um, uh, what is the major predators of, of these uh, water birds? And what we see in all three species, it's, it's avian. It's, it's avian. And if we take that another step further, of all the predation, this isn't just avian, but of all the predation that happens, you can see that it's, it's you know, for terns especially and for, for avocets, it's almost, you know, it's, it's a lot of California gulls. Still chicks a little less so because of the cover, but still a significant portion of their predation is from California gulls. So now we need to look at California gulls. We need to look at what is the behavior of California gulls. How are they using their habitats so that we can then think about how to manage the system in a way to keep those water birds safe if we're going to be designing sites. So here is, we've t uh, in this study, we, uh, we radioed, 100 plus, I think, uh, California gulls over two years. Each dot represents a single observation on a single day of, a, of an individual. And then you can prim put, uh, basically estimate home ranges for these things, for, each, for these birds as a whole. And then the yellow is what we consider core areas, where they're you know, really using it. And what you see, if I can do this without advancing, maybe not, is you have sites like, this is A6 their breeding site, Coyote Hills, another breeding colony. This is the, right next to the Tri-City Landfill, probably a roosting site. Here is the Nubia Island Landfill and probably a, a, you know, a site nearby. And so what we can do then is actually overlay that with all the nesting efforts we have and all the, where all the birds are. And you can kind of see where predation pressures are probably, where there's a lot of pressure for these gulls, for, or from these gulls on these water birds. Now the big the problem here is, this is 0708. Come, oh, come 2011, there's no A6 breeding colony. So that's going to move somewhere. Newbie Landfill is actually doing a really good job of, of uh, hazing the birds. So they're probably not using that. So where are things now? And I think that's, that's an important question that we'd like to answer in terms of how does that now change the pressure that we see with water birds and the predation pressures that we see. So... One last one that I think ties it both together. Just to, just to summarize, we see that nest survival is higher on islands and lower in, 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 in vegetated areas and marshes where mammals can get to. By, or contrary to that, during the chick rearing, we see chicks survive a lot better in the vegetation than they do out all alone on an island. So you would expect then a good design would have a site with islands next to a site with vegetation. And we found one of those, A16 in, in New Chicago Marsh has this setup. And we radioed some um, avocet chicks and still chicks and just to see what happened. And sure enough, what we saw was that nearly all the avocet chicks that were nesting on those islands, they moved to cover. 
they moved to that area when they had it. And so what we did was we saw the ones that didn't do that died. Um, so now I want to just look forward real quick. We, we see what's, what's happening uh, in, in the next few years in, in the end of phase one here where we have the new islands in SF2 that have been created. We have the A6 breach that's going to happen. We have the AH flooding and breach that's going to happen. And not too distant in the future probably, we have the A16 islands. And so one of the things we're doing next year is really taking a look at this F2, SF2 site that's been developed. 30 plus islands have been created. Water's now in there. They're available to be used. We expect to see a lot of birds coming in there trying to nest. W what are they going to select? Are they going to select the round islands, the long islands? Are they going to select the leeward side? or the, you know, which, Are they going to choose a spot that's hidden from the wind? Are they going to choose a spot that's to the north or south by the, you know, up by the road? Um, just in terms of just se selection. And then in disturbance, there's, we're going to be looking at the effect that that trail has on, on the sites. There's a lot of variation in distance, so we're going to see how that affects it. Density dependence. I talked a little bit about the growth. This is probably going to be the most dense site out there. If all of those birds that hatch are there, how does that affect growth rates? How does that affect their ability to survive? And that leads into the next one in terms of nesting and chicks. Does this site sur suffice or, 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 or improve or maintain water bird populations both for the nesting birds and the, and the eggs as well as the chicks because that's, that's an important part or there needs to be nearby adjacent habitat that can do that. Um, I'm going to leave this one. I think, we'll, I think Cheryl will talk about it quite a bit but the impact of the A6 breach and how it's going to affect water birds is a, is a real unknown this year. We'll have some water bird surveys that will answer that but it would be really interesting to have some uh, information on the gulls as well and how they're moving, how they're changing, even how they're breeding. And then finally, I'll just conclude by saying I think this is one of the most important things. We need to keep collecting this data. We need these long-term data sets. It's this adaptive management. It's this evaluating SF2, linking it and comparing it to sites we've collected over a number of years, comparing the growth rate at SF2 versus other areas, that that really becomes the power of, of informing and doing adaptive management is you have that information not only at the baseline, not only at other sites replicated, but also at the sites you're learning from. And then basically learning from SF2 to make A16 or the next islands after that. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. So next up will uh, be Caitlin Robinson Nielsen from San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory. And she'll be um, giving a very complimentary talk about snowy plovers and their breeding success in San Francisco Bay. All right. I'm a little shorter than Mark here. Um, I'd like to start off by acknowledging my co-authors, Jill Blusso Demers and Cheryl Strong of the Fish and Wildlife Service and Scott Demers from H.T. Harvey. And today I'll be talking about determining the effects of some habitat enhancements that we've been doing and also predators on western snowy plovers. So to start off, most of you probably know this already, but western snowy plovers are a small shorebird. They are listed as a threatened species by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and they are a pond dependent species. They nest on the dry salt pond bottoms. Um, they do not use tidal marsh areas, so their habitat will be reduced um, as the salt pond project moves forward and um, opens areas up to tidal actions. Um, so the recovery goal that was set by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for the San Francisco Bay is um, we'd like to be able to support 500 breeding birds within the San Francisco Bay. Um, and the restoration project has agreed to support 250 of these breeding birds within their restoration project area. Um, right now we estimate that there's probably between 130 and 200 plovers in the bay. Um, we think it depends a lot on water levels um, year to year on how many birds we actually do support in the bay here. Um, so uh, SFBBO and the refuge has been monitoring plovers in the bay since um, 2003, but I'm going to present the data from 2004 on. Um, and as these are just the observed um, plover nest success in the South Bay. Um, you can see here, oops, um, if you look 
or um, the x-axis here is um, years, and the y-axis is the percent of um, plovers with the various nest fates. So you can see there's a big drop in these blue bars here, which are the numbers of nests that have hatched. And this middle section here, which is the number of nests that were depredated, has really increased in the past six years. Um, I do also want to add, uh, Mark brought up an important point that um, hatching is kind of just half of what we need to um, measure breeding success with, and uh, SFBBO has color banded um, 263 uh, plover chicks in the last three years, and we do know that um, roughly between 24 and 28 percent of those chicks survive until fledging, so it's a really low rate. So not only are typically under 50 percent of our nests hatching, those nests that do hatch um, only about you know 25 to 30 percent of those chicks are making it to fledging. So it's kind of rough for the plovers out there. Um, like many people have talked about today, as the salt pond project goes forward, they're going to be reducing the, um, the number of managed ponds available for birds and fish and increasing the amount of tidal marsh. And this is definitely going to impact the plovers because they are, like I said, those pond dependent species. Um, so the map up right now is uh, the current ponds that the um, snowy plovers nest on right now. And I do want to point out that the majority of the plovers, over 60% of our bay's plovers, do breed up at Eden Landing. It's a very important spot for them. They also breed on the SF2 ponds um, down in the Fremont, the Warm spring, Springs ponds, um, a few locations down in Alviso. And I didn't mark it, but we did have one nest on A6 this past year with the 24,000 nesting gulls. So it was not the smartest plover around. <laughs> um, so this is the numbers of ponds that are going to be available to plovers after um, the phase one actions are over. So um, I'm not sure of the exact acreage, but the numbers of ponds up at Eden Landing will be reduced um, as well as part of SF2, and I do want to point out that down in Alviso, with opening up A8, which was their main pond that they nested on, um, there probably won't be much habitat available um, for them to breed at all, um, and the Warm Springs ponds in Fremont will still be there. Um, so one of the key uncertainties, um, like many people have talked about, uh, is how are these water birds, these snowy plovers, going to respond to um, this decrease in um, nesting habitat available. Uh, so what we wanted to figure out is how do we increase the number of snowy plovers nesting and the nest success within the project area. It's going to be really important for us to fit the same number of plovers in a smaller habitat footprint, and we actually want to increase the number of plovers in a smaller habitat area. So what we started um, in 2008 was a snowy plover habitat enhancement project. And what this involved was spreading oyster shells on um, the dry salt pond bottoms. And as you can see with this picture, it's pretty dark there, um, a lot of the salt pond bottoms are pretty dark and pretty flat. So you can just imagine a mostly white snowy plover sitting out there, they like a glowing light bulb out there for predators to see. So we thought that if we added um, additional white objects out there, it would help camouflage both um, the incubating plovers as well as their eggs and their chicks. Um, so uh, what we did was we um, spread oyster shells over one hectare plots and compared um, the plover response to those plots to um, randomly um, chosen control plots in the ponds, which did not have any shells. Um, in 2009, we had seven shell and control plots down. In 2010, we had 12 shell plots. And uh, this fall, we spread three more, so we'll have 15 total for this coming breeding season. And um, both years, we've seen an enormous um, increase in the nest density um, within these shell plots. And uh, I just want to point out that in 2009, we didn't have any nests at all in our control plots. Um, so we decided to do a bunch of our comparisons 
to all the other nests at Eden Landing. Um, so if you look at the shell plots compared to all the other nests at Eden Landing, we're seeing you know over three nests per hectare, and um, in all the other nests it was like 0.03 nests per hectare. So we thought this was great. You know they're really using those shell plots in high density. And in 2009, we found that the um, nests that were in the shell plots were much more likely to nest than those not in shell plots, which again, this is great, you know, the nests in the shell plots are actually surviving. However, this past year in 2010, um, there we go, you can see that there is absolutely no difference in the proportion of nests that hatched at, between the shell plots and the areas with no shells. Um, we don't know if the predators may have cued in on these shell plots as a food source or um, what exactly is going on there, but we're definitely interested in taking another year of data to see if the predators really hone in on these shell plots. You know, we don't know, are we going to have worse nest success in the shell plots than outside the shell plots? And um, the last thing we want to do is lure plovers to these areas where they're going to get eaten. Um, so as I keep on talking about, uh, predation is a really big issue for plovers out there. Um, so with the help of Scott Demers at H.G. Harvey, we developed a um, nest camera system. And um, how we do this is we um, can watch the plovers on their nests. We have DVRs that record footage 24 hours a day. Our cameras are out on the pond and they have infrared vision so we're recording 24 7 out there um, and we have all of our equipment on the levee um, with hopes to reduce disturbance to the nesting plovers every time we need to change the batteries and um, download the data um, and so this is some of what we've caught um, I want to just point out before the video starts that here is a plover um, running away from its nest and um, I did cut out about um, 30 seconds of footage here in the middle. It's not super fun to watch 30 seconds of a blank screen, but um, as you can see, a California gull landed and ate all three eggs and has since taken off. Um, and I do want to say that this is one of our slower California gull depredation events that we recorded. Um, the other three landed, ate the eggs, or we film them eating chicks too and have taken off within about four seconds. Um, so they're fast and um, pretty easy to miss with motion detector detection cameras, which is why we wanted the continuous speed. Uh, so the results from our camera and nest studies, um, we've captured six different species depredating nests. Um, California gulls were um, depredating nests and chicks both years. We've also filmed uh, northern harriers, uh, red-tailed hawks, common ravens, a ready turnstone, which was a surprise. <laughs> They're a small shorebird for those of you who don't know. Um, and we got our first mammalian predator this year, which was a gray fox. Um, and I just want to point out that, as you can see, there's a large variety of predators that do depredate nests. So in terms of trying to focus in on what to manage for, it's really hard. There's just a lot out there that will eat plovers. Um, so I'd like to make a few recommendations and um, for the whole question of how do we increase the number of nesting snowy plovers in the area. And we've talked a lot about using shell plots and putting more shell plots out there. And we d really do need some more data before I think we should go out and spread more shells. It, it m just might not be the answer. Um, we don't want to, you know, like I said, lure plovers into an area where they're going to get eaten. And um, we just definitely need to monitor the plovers really carefully because we may need more area managed for plovers in the future than what the salt pond has you know, planned for. You know, that's not very popular to say. <laughs> um, and we really need continued funding for predator management and the refuge right now is working on the development of a, gull, a California gull management plan, which is awesome and um, we hope to see that finished before April when they start nesting again. And um, as a side note too, we 
definitely support and recommend continuing coordination during construction. Um, plovers like dry salt ponds and so do construction workers. <laughs> so that's created um, an interesting time in the past two years. So continued coordination to avoid any conflicts with plovers is great. All right, thank you very much. Great, thank you, Caitlin. And our final speaker for the session will be Dr. Lynn Trulio, who will be talking about snowy plovers and um, a disturbance study that she's been, <coughs> been doing. Thanks, Lynn. Ah, perfect height. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. Uh, what a great group to see everybody here. I'm here to talk about a study that we conducted um, just last year on um, nesting snowy plover response to uh, novel or to new trail use. And I wanted to um, thank my um, co-PIs and my co-investigators on this project, Caitlin Robinson Nielsen, um, SFBBO, um, who has done a nice introduction to this because we'll be continuing the topic of snowy plovers. And John Sokale from Sokale Environmental Planning and Kevin Lafferty from USGS. So as everybody is probably aware, there are six primary project objectives for the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project. And um, they, you know, they're listed here. And um, primary among these objectives, of course, are ecological objectives to, to restore tidal salt marsh for rare and endangered species and also to protect the diversity and abundance of species using the ponded habitats. Um, also, a, a key objective is is public access to allow the public to enjoy um, the, the bay, to enjoy the restoration, and to, to love it so that they will continue to support it in many ways, including financially. Um, but, you know, some of these goals are potentially competing goals. So, for instance, public access versus wildlife protection uh, might potentially be, be competing uh, in the sense that um, the, the project has to balance. We've heard a bit about some of these balances that the project is doing. The project needs to balance public access and wildlife needs. So to, um, oops, um, so to uh, provide public access, the project is planning and is implementing uh, new public access features such as trails in particular, overlooks, and kayak launches. So the question is, its balance is, uh, will public access reduce species protection? If so, what can we do about that? And I wanted to mention that public access is one of the key uncertainties. The public access wildlife connection is one of the key uncertainties uh, for the project. Uh, one thing about the trails that are being planned is that they are typically not being planned next to tidal marsh habitat or habitat that will be turned into tidal marsh so that endangered species, endangered tidal marsh species are not affected by the trails. So most of the trails are being planned next to ponded habitat and seasonally ponded habitat. And as a result, these trails have the potential to affect a number of foraging and nesting species, in particular the uh, threatened snowy plover. Um, because trails are, are a big part of the salt pond project and a big part of public access around the bay, uh, we have a number of studies that we have conducted and are continuing to conduct on trails. And we know that um, the response of animals to public access depends on the type of access, but also on the species. Different species respond differently and on locations, so there are a number of different factors. As a result, um, we have studies, um, uh, John Sokal and I conducted a study on trails and shorebirds that we published a few years ago, and we are extending that study to look at the effect of um, habituation, um, actually to look at the effect of new trail use on shorebirds. Our original study looked at habituation in particular. Um, we have a study, uh, Heather White, uh, one of my grad students um, conducted a study on trails and waterfowl, and we are extending that study now in collecting more data to learn more about 
how waterfowl respond to trail use, and we know that they, they care pretty deeply about trail use. Um, and I also wanted to mention I have a number of students who are looking at um, boats and uh, harbor seals and sea otters and how they respond to kayaks and boats. Today I'm talking about trails and the Snowy Plover Project. Okay, so we looked at these two research questions for the Snowy Plover um, Project. Um, do plovers respond differently to people who have disturbed them versus people they have not seen before? We wanted to look at this question um, because there are a number of studies have shown that birds, uh, for instance, there's a study by Levy uh, of urban mockingbirds, and the mockingbirds actually could recognize people, individuals, individual people who had disturbed them and responded differently to people who had, they had seen before who had disturbed them versus new people who approached them. So we wanted to see if plovers were, shall we say, that plastic in their um, uh, response to people. Um, but our main question, of course, was um, looking at the response of shorebirds, in particular the flush rate and the flush distance of nesting snowy plovers in response to trail use. Okay, our study methods. So we conducted this study last year uh, from March to August, and we looked at snowy plovers on seasonally dry ponds in the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project. All the nests were initially located by um, SFBBO staff, and they were, um, the positions were uh, located and um, their GPS locations were put into the unit, the GPS unit. Uh, within two to four days, we conducted a trial in which a trail walker walked along the levee, and we collected data on um, the distance at which the birds flushed off their nest, which is they, were t they primarily did one of two things. They flushed off their nest or they hunkered down and stayed on their nest. All nests that we looked at were within 125 meters of a levee. And uh, we, like I say, we compared, um, all, so all the approaches were tangential. We did not directly approach birds. We were always on a levee. And um, we looked at trail walkers versus researcher walkers. And the researcher was a person that the bird had seen before. Okay, the trail walker was somebody they hadn't seen before. So the researcher was the person who had approached the bird initially, located the nest, and done the GPS. So that was that, that first question we were looking at, and then compared to control trials. Here are our locations. Uh, as Caitlin mentioned, um, a lot of the birds are um, nesting in, in Eden Landing, and so most of our nests were, were in Eden Landing. Uh, there were also some nests, a uh, couple of nests in SF2 before it got too gnarly out there with the construction, and um, R4 in Ravenswood. So what did we find? Um, these are preliminary results, preliminary because uh, USGS is still uh, reviewing our report, but we're pretty close to, to done with that. Um, so the first question, researchers versus trail walkers. Well, first of all, we conducted 31 trials. 11 researcher walkers, 10 trail walkers, and 10 control. And we found absolutely no difference in flush distance, in the, in the distance at which birds flushed, uh, to trail walkers versus researchers. So they didn't, they didn't distinguish between researchers and trail walkers. And given that, we combined the data for all the walker trials together and compared that to the control. So um, one thing we found was Four out of the 21 uh, trials with trail walkers, the birds did not flush off their nests as the, as the walker went by. They stayed on their nest and hunkered down. Um, compared to the control, the birds flushed 80% of the time in walker trials, whereas in the control trials, birds were flushed off their nest only 20% of the control trials. So there was obviously a very, very big difference. So birds um, were significantly um, disturbed by or flushed off their nest um, significantly more than um, the background rate of disturbance. We found the average flush, flush distance was about 146 meters. And uh, if we look at the cumulative percent of birds flushing going off their nests, um, that, that rate of flush goes up significantly, 
yeah, forget it, goes up significantly uh, at about 150 meters. So that's sort of, sort of the, the number that we found where the birds were very responsive to, to trail walkers. One thing we found was um, a very, sort of a weak correlation. We don't have a tremendous amount of data uh, with only 31 trials, but, and, and this is based on 15 um, trials, but the longer um, the trail walk went on, the longer the birds stayed off their nest. So uh, that, that's a, a question sort of worthy of, of further study. We looked at a couple of other factors and didn't find Fortunately, that the distance of the scope uh, to the nest, that was not a factor. I uh, didn't find that the nest distance, the distance of the, the perpendicular distance of the, um, of the nest to the levee um, was not a factor in the distance at which the birds flushed. So if a nest was closer to the levee, that doesn't necessarily mean they flushed or didn't flush. And the age of the nest didn't seem to have an effect on um, the flush distance. But again, this is, um, you know, not a lot of data. So our management considerations based on, um, based on what we found were that um, new trail use, so all of these trials occurred in places where trails do not occur. New trail use resulted in birds flushing at rates much greater than the background rate. Background rate was 20% and birds flushed at a rate of 80% with trail walkers. And um, we found that the distance that the birds started to really respond was 150 meters from the walker. Um, so um, existing trails within 150 meters of nesting birds may also disturb nesting birds, but there is um, you know, some literature that shows that snowy plovers can become habituated to people um, so existing nests may respond differently to trail use. Some study suggestions. Um, we think it's important to quantify nesting snowy plover response to existing trails. Uh, so I, and that, that's, that's something that would require, you know, quite, quite a bit of work, I think, because if you want to see if birds habituate, you have to make sure that trail use is very, very regular, not just once every and a couple times a day or something. So it has to be a very regular use of the trail. Uh, it would be good to determine the source of the background disturbances. We really couldn't determine that with our study. To try and estimate the impacts of human disturbance on nest success and also um, Study the factors contributing to birds staying on their nests versus flushing. That, and more, more study of this type could help us understand that. We undertook this study to provide the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Managers with information that would help them manage the ponds and the restoration given the various project objectives. As Caitlin mentioned, the amount of the amount of habitat for snowy plovers is declining in the salt pond restoration area because of the restoration. And so the birds are challenged by having less habitat. And right now, trails are being considered primarily next to the types of habitats where snowy plovers nest, as well as ponded habitat. And that could also be another factor uh, that would be a challenge and could um, be a, um, could be a problem for, plo for plovers in the project. So, so in the end, um, it trails that are being planned near plover habitat should really take um, the plovers into account and realize that they are losing habitat. They are very sensitive species and so they require a lot of careful management. So I wanted to thank our funders, the Resources Legacy Fund Foundation and the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project and all the support provided by the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory and thanks to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Department of Fish and Game. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Lynn. Um, and with that, I think all the um, speakers need to come up and take a seat. And we'll have some time for some questions.
Okay, I think we're ready with the microphones. Um, if we have any questions out there. Sure, back there. I was wondering if in SF2, in addition to the shapes and the aspect, if there are different surface treatments to the islands. <laughs> Actually, I can probably address that one. Um, there are not at this time. That was uh, the way the design was. We wanted to answer some of those other aspect and, and shape first and get some answers there before we add another complicating layer of different surface treatments. So the thought was to answer those questions first and then in a subsequent phase, once vegetation management starts to become an issue in three, five, seven years, then we start working with different surface treatments and, and add in that element at that time. So. Great. You got Peggy? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I I can't recall what was the habitat that Plover used before we had salt ponds in the bay. I know I used to know this. Um, and I'm wondering whether there is any work going on in the bay to create more of whatever that would have been other than just relying on the salt ponds to do that. There are actually no records of snowy plovers within the bay before the salt ponds existed. They're primarily a beach nesting species. Um, but beaches are a lot like, or salt ponds are a lot like beaches. They're big, wide open spaces with little vegetation. So, you know, plovers definitely could make the move to salt ponds very easily. There may have been some salt pan habitat, I believe in Hayward and a few other places historically that there could have been a plover, but, um, but we don't know if they were there for sure. Okay, next question. I see, well, let's go on this side. Caitlin, you, you commented that the nest success of plovers in the oyster shell areas ended up being no different than in the untreated areas, but did you not also say that there were more nests so that even if percentage success was the same, you had, you had more, success, more successful plovers in the treated areas? Right, and that's something we want to investigate this coming year and see if we have more, you know, higher nest predation rates within those shell plots um, because we don't want to be creating really high density areas where they're nesting and then have all the nests depredated there. So, um, yeah, there are more nests there, the same amount are getting depredated, but it could be a problem in the future if predators queue in on those areas. Okay, um, Laura. So, Caitlin, I have a follow-up question on that. So, it seemed from your data um, you were showing that depredation has increased over the last seven or eight years, I think. I can't remember exactly what that chart showed. Um, but then um, California gulls were, were certainly on your list of predators, but in terms of the number of times or the number of depredations that the California gull was responsible for wasn't didn't strike me as being really overwhelming. It seemed like there was a scattering of depredation by different species. And so, you know, as we're, we'll talk later about the California gull issue, and certainly there's, you know, depredations with other species, but it, 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 it's not overwhelming to me that from the data that you showed that the gull is primarily responsible. Is that just a limitation in the kind of um, study design or do you think there's other factors that are responsible for, um, you know, increasing avian predation on, on the plover's nest? I think one thing that would be interesting to look at and I haven't is when the gulls started nesting in those northern coyote hills, the N, 2A and N3A colony um, because I'm not sure when that colony developed but that might have, if it's been in the last seven years, that colony's um, less than a couple of miles away from Eden Landing where most of the plovers are so um, that might be a reason why we're getting increased depredation rates 
And um, I think, yeah, we just, we're going to have our cameras back out there this year and we need to get a better handle of everything that's, that's depredating plovers. Just a note, I think overall it was like 25% of all nest depredations were California galls, correct, on snowy plovers? Right. Oh. Yeah. Okay, uh, next question. No, oh, good. Yeah, I remember the one of the study speakers mentioned that mockingbirds can recognize individuals. And similar research, University of Washington showed crows can do that. And I also noticed that gulls learn about human behavior, like near the end of a game at Cal, the, cr the gulls come to eat the leftovers. Are you at all concerned that your researchers are tour guides to nesting sites for gulls? <laughs> Before we approach any snowy plover nests, we always do a scan with binoculars to make sure there's no avian predators in the area. Um, because yeah, we are very aware that crows and ravens and gulls will follow, you know, your footprints out to a nest. And um, on the ponds where we are leaving footprints, we try and walk in like zigzag lines around both out to the nest and on the way back, so we're not leaving footprints in a straight shot to and from the nest. Do anything to add? And I wanted to add uh, for the study design, looking at the effect of trail walkers, we. Uh, the, the nest was, went, has, was approached once by SFBBO to find it because uh, you, can't, you can't find it unless you go out and, and uh, then we used GPS units to figure out the distance that we were, the walkers were from the nest. So we did not approach the nest at all for our study. Mark, do you have any comments on that? Uh, I can just so I can say something. Um, <laughs> I would, I would say with a, a lot of ours, it's um, islands. And so I'm not sure we have specifically that. I think those birds know that those islands are there and, and the gulls would know that the chicks are there. I don't think we're attracting them to those. I do want to note that in, the, um, in areas where there's beach nesting plovers, it's, it's thought that ravens congregate in areas that humans also congregate. So trail use in the future might draw future predators, not, not just gulls, possibly other other species. Um, more questions over there. For uh, managed ponds, there are many ways that ponds can be managed. Their water level, salinity, temperature, um, perhaps even food resources from the talks we heard earlier. Uh, from your studies, and this is probably mostly a question for Ariana and Mark, are there lessons that have been learned for how to better manage um, the, the sort of physical habitat within the managed ponds? Uh, I, you know, I think that there's still work to be done to quantify, uh, you know, the ranges or the thresholds that define habitat for specific groups. We have, you know, general ideas of the ranges of water depths that birds require or the ranges of salinity, um, but, you know, there is a lot that can be done with the data that, that has been collected in this system since 2002. Um, you know, to, to define more specific aspects that, that birds need. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot more work to be done in that area. I think uh, one thing I would point out, uh, that A12 study where they actually dropped the water down to show the islands, they actually, beyond just the bird part, there was a component there with Mark Marvin um, and Josh and everybody and we've got a poster out there that, that really looked at how that might uh, affect methyl, uh, methylated mercury levels and, and issues like that. I know and this is before my time and I, I only know the story so I, I'm not sure really the history behind it but I know there's also been due to some management actions uh, some potential drops in DO where it was, it was affecting fish but I, I, I don't know the answers specific to that one. You know, the other thing is that um, we, I think we already do know a fair bit about what these specific bird groups need. For example, we know that diving ducks need deep habitat. We know that uh, dabbling ducks need, you know, a certain depth of water. And it, it's almost like the decision is more uh, an active one, like basically what kind of bird numbers or habitats do people want to prioritize? You know, it sort of kind of comes down to that. Um, we can make some, some judgments about uh, sort of duplication of habitat. For example, the batch ponds, um, 
are, are largely mimicking those of the production ponds. So, you know, where we get down to these really tough decisions of what to do with the habitat that is available, uh, we might be able to sort of, you know, re-establish um, conditions, you know, that, that would uh, provide, you know, habitat for, for other, you know, other groups. I mean, if, for example, the production ponds fulfill the role for specialist species such as the phalaropes, the eared greaves, the mew and the Bonaparte skulls, which require that really high salinity conditions. And then perhaps the batch ponds, that, that area that is available, could be uh, taken to a lower salinity condition that would then in turn uh, provide habitat for ducks. So I, I really do think it becomes sort of a difficult social decision in a way as to which, um, which animals to provide habitat for. That's a great comment. Thank you, Ariana. Um, more questions? All right, in the back. Oops. This one's for Lynn, relative to the, and or anybody else who cares to comment, but the, the idea of focusing trail access in relationship to managed ponds seems kind of counterintuitive in that, you know, people are on elevated spaces, wide open, visible to species that tend to be disturbed by the introduction of uh, walkers or hikers versus putting them in uh, more relationship to tidal areas, particularly where you have a large marsh expanse uh, and species that are probably a little more tolerant. So any comments? Oh, sure, Carl. Um, Unless, and, and Laura and John, you can chime in here. Uh, un unless things have changed with the thinking of, of the restoration, in, in general, the trails were planned to be not next to tidal habitat or places that were going to become tidal in order to protect clapper rails and saltmarsh harp mice <laughs> because they are endangered species. And we don't understand, well, there isn't any good data on whether, for instance, clapper rails are sensitive to trail use or not, and uh, that I haven't seen published, so maybe it's out there. Uh, and so the thinking was then to have the trails next to ponded habitats and seasonal ponds. Now, um, the study that John Sokale and I did that we published a little while ago showed that foraging <laughs> small shorebirds are not too, not too worried, not too interested, did not really respond to, trail, to trails that have been there for a while next to their foraging habitat. But Heather White and I have found that ducks really care about trails being next to their ponded habitat. So some species are a little are more sensitive than others. And uh, so, so all I can say is that the thinking, Carl, was, you know, to, to um, avoid the, the tidal salt marsh habitats and that's why trails are sort of planned near these ponded areas, but these ponded areas can have very sensitive species using them, such as nesting snowy plovers. Yeah, I would say it's largely, you know, the clapper rail and the salt marsh harvest mouse, but also just, you know, kind of physically how our system is set up the levees are around the ponds, um, and so the natural place to put a trail is on a, an existing levee. That's just kind of the, the, um, the built environment that we're in. So, um, but that's why we're doing this study, is we want to understand this better. And, and we do know, um, you know, there is depredation of California clapper rail by such things as feral cats, et cetera. So we do know there is um, predation uh, pressure on those species, those marsh species as well. Do you want to add anything? Okay. <laughs> okay. We have a uh, question over here. I have a question. Uh, I'm not a biologist, but this just occurred to me. Um, curiosity. Uh, if you have a plum tree, you put chicken wire around it to protect the, the plum, or not the plums, but a, a pear tree. Is there any consideration of putting some kind of a uh, screen to protect an area for uh, the plovers that the seagulls couldn't get into? 
They've been nest exclosures, which is basically what you're talking about, have been used um, quite extensively on the coast for snowy plovers and then on the east coast for piping plovers, which is a similar species. And um, they've, there's been a study that's shown that it's increased adult mortality by um, when a predator comes by and the bird flushes off the nest, them having to go like shrink down and fit through the exclosure to escape slows them down and makes them a much easier target for the predator day to get. Um, so we are, we really don't want to, you know, have our adult plovers depredated. It's much better to lose a nest. And also, um, exclosures don't increase chick fledging success at all. So y yes, you can get the eggs to hatch, but your chick survival rate is just the same. So um, as of right now, it's, for us, it's not a clear benefit. Yeah, we, <laughs> yeah, Lynn brought up little chick protection, protection houses with a lot of lease turns. They'll put out little like A-frame houses, I guess, <laughs> for them. And um, that was one thing we were kind of hoping the shells would provide is a little bit of cover for the chicks to hide next to and hide under um, and help them survive. But. Uh, We've seen no difference in the number of chicks that have fledged from shell plots versus um, non-shelled areas. Plover chicks are precocial, which means they're up and running within a couple hours, and they just don't stay in those shell plots. So <laughs> um, they, they usually lead the chicks elsewhere to forage. Okay, we have time for one more question, and I think we already have somebody back. Has there been any relationship between time off nest and nest fate? with the snowy plovers and or location of nests relative to levees that if if birds within 150 meters are the ones getting off but those are the nests that are failing anyway are you reducing survival we nests. haven't looked at either time off of nest for the disturbance study in nest fate or um, proximity to the levee in nest fate but that's definitely something we can look into Okay, we do have time, or we have one more question. Uh, this is just a comment. Uh, I recall the, the early planning days of where to put the trails and the reasons for avoiding areas with clapper rails. And over the last uh, five or six years, we've done many hundreds of clapper rail surveys around the bay as part of the Spartina project. And we're finding that they're really quite a lot bolder than we had thought they were. They don't seem to be really all that shy at all, and they seem to get used to us being there very quickly. Um, and we probably will never publish this information. Maybe we should. I don't know. <laughs> the response of clapper rails to people and trails needs to be quantified. But that's a good observation. Great. Well, thank you all, all the presenters. And I want to thank uh, John and Laura for organizing this session. And uh, I believe we have a break. Okay. So we're going to take a 10 minute break. If the speakers from the last session would come and check in, that would be great. Uh, I, believe, I believe there's uh, some water and cookies in there for snacks, and uh, we'll see you at 2.35.